There are millions of feet of pressurized pipeline in the United States that are aging and that need to be rehabilitated. In this episode of the Civil Engineering Podcast, Steve Soldati, civil engineer, is going to give us some strategies for rehabilitating those aging pipelines. And he's also going to provide us with two steps that you can take if you're a civil engineer looking to navigate a transition or make a change in your career. Let's do it. All right, now I'd like to welcome Steve Soldati. Steve is a civil engineer with in situ form. And Steve, welcome back to the Civil Engineering Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me again. So Steve, it's been a while since you've been on the podcast, about you know, 75 episodes or so. Mm-hmm. You've had some career transition since that time. Mm-hmm. Um, take us through that a little bit. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Anthony, for having me back on. Um, when uh, we last hosted a, uh, a podcast series, uh, with me on, um, I was working uh, as an internal uh, in-house club cus- uh, consultant uh, for the Florida's uh, Turnpike Authority, uh, and f- um, I it was more of a consulting role um, that I uh, was in. Was there for a, a few years, uh, really helping the the client, uh, you know, plan, budget, uh, and execute uh, projects uh, from small transportation projects all the way up to to major. Um, uh, multi-million dollar, multi-year uh, projects. Uh, but a, a part of me, uh, just due to my personality and, and due to my desire for my career, um, had always had a desire to get into more of a, a sales and business development role, uh, really help companies uh, take that next leap, um, moving forward with uh, whatever goals they have uh, as a business. business. And so um, I actually reached out um, to a couple companies um, and realized that I think more of a, a product sale company was, was kind of more of a, a better fit for me. And so I, uh, I started kind of putting some feelers out and, uh, and got with a company in situ form technologies who, who is currently looking to make these leaps and, and, and change directions and go into uh, some new uh, directions to help uh, keep up with the aging infrastructure uh, that we have in America. Uh, and so, um, after a few interviews and and a few some few discussions, um, I was fortunately uh, asked to come on board, and I've been here for the last five months or so, um, you know, trying to uh, really push things in in a new direction, you know, for the company. So it's been great. That's so great. Far. Congratulations on on making that change. It's not always easy to make a career change. You kind of, of have course. to identify that you want to do something different, and then go through the process. Oh yeah. So what we're going to focus on here today, Steve, is pressurized pipeline and how it's related to the conversation around infrastructure. And we're going to really dive into that. The first thing I want to ask you, though, and I I think maybe a lot of our listeners will get this, but for some of our listeners who might practice in different disciplines or might be civil engineering students, just what is a pressurized pipeline to start? Yeah, of course. Uh, You know, of course, civil engineering is such a broad uh, array of various infrastructure pieces, you know, from transportation. Uh, to uh, structural, so like, you know, skyscrapers and other buildings. Uh, but of course, we have the conveyance of, of you know, water, uh, gas, fuel, um, you know, whatever it may be uh, throughout the whole country. Uh, and so a, a pressurized uh, pipeline is, is essentially the com- uh, a, a pipe, whether it's steel, cast iron, uh, concrete, uh, that conveys uh, a fluid, you know, whether it's water or wastewater or, or a fuel, gas, um, oil. Uh, with the use of uh, mostly, you know, pumps to get it from point A to point B where you don't have the topography uh, helping you uh, with, you know, um, a pipeline flow, you know, maybe from like a high part of a mountain down to a a community. And so um, there are, uh, you know, millions of feet, millions upon millions of feet of of pressurized pipeline uh, throughout the country that are underground and that, most of us kind of take for granted, but the, the easiest example of what a pressurized, you know, pipeline is, is how you get your drinking water uh, at your house or apartment. Um, you know, that, that water uh, being brought to you is coming from either a, a water tank um, somewhere in the, in the near facility uh, and then uh, being pumped and um, using gravity uh, to come to your house. And so when you turn on that faucet, uh, you know, you have that, that nice pressurized uh, um, you know, water flow. 
for sure. So, yeah, potable water, gas, as Steve recommended, you know, systems that are closed, whereas I did a lot of work in stormwater. You know, stormwater systems are typically open to the surface, right? Yes. Water gets in through catch basins and it flows by gravity, as, as Steve suggested, for the most part. Right. So, in terms of these press, pressurized pipe systems, what is the landscape of the nation's existing pressurized pipeline infrastructure? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, we, uh, uh, with Institute Form Technologies, uh, you know, we partner up with the uh, Trenchless Technology Center uh, over at Louisiana State University, and they've done uh, surveys and studies, uh, and they uh, have found that there are more than 1 million miles of, of water mains, you know, so potable water mains uh, under pressure throughout the entire country. And this, you know, from pipe materials from PVC to asbestos pipe, concrete pipe, cast iron, you know, ductile iron. Uh, and whatnot, a, a majority of, of that pipe material being cast iron. Uh, and of those uh, 1 million miles of, of water main uh, pipelines, over 60% of that quantity uh, range from six to 10 uh, inches in diameter. So we're not talking very huge pipes, but we're talking just a network, a vast network uh, of pressurized pipe supplying potable water to various communities, various businesses, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, and That's then on, on top of that, uh, we also need to be able to treat, you know, wastewater, right? So, every, you know, every time you go to the bathroom, every time you, you, uh, you go to a restaurant and they're flushing everything down a sink, um, all that water needs to be conveyed to treatment plants. And so with, with that network of, um, of pipelines on the tail end of, of water use, uh, there are uh, over 60,000 miles uh, of force mains with very similar pipe materials as the, the potable water side. Now. It, there's almost half of that 60,000 miles of force mains and other sewer uh, pipelines under pressure. Um, there's, a, it, you know, that the range is from four to 12 inches in diameter. So again, uh, a vast majority of pipelines underground uh, are anywhere from four uh, to 12 inches uh, in diameter. Underground uh, cannot be seen, but need to be addressed here uh, in the near future. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And, you know, when you talk about numbers like that, Steve, it again reinforces kind of the importance of what civil engineers do, you know, in relation to everyday life, you know, all of the, we're working on water systems that deliver, you know, potable water to people. And, you know, obviously potable water is critical to the health of, of the citizens of our, of our countries and around the world. Mm -hmm. So to that end, you're talking about all of the different, the amounts of these pressurized pipe systems what is the risk associated with this aging infrastructure? Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, you, you kind of started with that with that risk. Is it's you know it, it's the, the the what is the you know the influence of the health of of the communities, and so you know the risk that we see with aging infrastructure is you know both a financial and an environmental risk, right? So, from uh, financially speaking, um, you know the longer you let an asset um, age and not be maintained or addressed. Uh, it's either going to deteriorate and fall apart, or it's going to uh, provide some type of uh, possible environmental uh, risk or health risk. You know, maybe you know from you know bacteria or you know a pipe leak or or whatever it may be to help um, to facilitate any type of infiltration infiltration uh, from maybe an uh, uh, an area uh, of contamination. Uh, but also, you know, from a, a wastewater standpoint, if a pipe is leaking, then you have uh, the influence of the environmental impact that could be very costly. Uh, and so really the, the risk is um, the longer we wait without addressing uh, proper uh, rehabilitation or replacement or even improvement of the infrastructure, it's going to be both more uh, expensive and also more devastating to the surrounding communities. And so, you know, one example is uh, your car, for example, you know, if you bought a car uh, and did not maintain it, you know, did not do anything to it and just ran it, you know, put 20,000 plus miles on it per year. Well, at some point uh, the repairs to that car are going to be uh, astronomical, or you're going to be in a dire situation where the car is just going to give out and, and, and die on you. And then, Unfortunately, that happened to me back in college. My my, my jeep, um, uh, a little piece, you know, broke, and I was stranded in the middle of the highway, you know, with uh, a huge disruption to to my weekly uh, routine. But same thing applies to 
uh, to infrastructure. You know, if a water main breaks, now we have folks who are depending on that water uh, for their daily use um, and or business. And so the, uh, the longer we wait, the, the more costly uh, and the more complicated things are going to, to be uh, in the future. So uh, need to address it now. Sure. And so, you know, all that makes sense. I mean, these are, you know, affect the health and well-being of the public and, you know, they're aging. We need to fix them. We need to repair them. We need to improve them from an engineering perspective. You know, everyone out there, if they heard this podcast and they were just, you know, not engineers that say, oh, that, that's great. Let's fix everything. But from an engineering perspective, what are the challenges in trying to address this aging infrastructure, these pressurized lines that are old and kind of decrepit? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, there, there's many challenges and, you know, uh, engineering uh, wouldn't be engineering if there were no challenges uh, that we had to tackle with various agencies and various uh, items. And so uh, a few of these challenges are the fact that there is a growing population um, within this country in various areas, but, you know, people continue, the, the population continues to grow where the demand is still high for potable water and to be able to treat the wastewater after that, that initial potable water uh, is used. Uh, and so with that, um, there's also an economic uh, challenge of disruption uh, that we're trying to avoid because, again, that, that's, there's, there's the direct costs of replacing materials and, and using the labor to do so. But there's also an indirect cost of, of how much it costs a community when you do disrupt a, a local business. Um, and and get in there and, and not be as efficient as as we as we can. So from an engineering standpoint, trying to find that optimal um, position where we can address the issues uh, and and then tackle those challenges, but while still being very efficient and innovative uh, with our uh, ways of methods of 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 construction. And so uh, with that, uh, there's also the the challenge of um, bypassing this water. So again, like I said, society demands a, a certain amount of water per day and sure. is reliant on that water. And so being able to continue to uh, supply that water while under construction is a huge challenge that we need to be able to uh, tackle. Uh, you know, one example is the transportation world. You know, we see it all everywhere where we have construction on the highways uh, but they're not having to shut down the entire highway um, and uh, up to perform either a widening or a resurfacing or some type of work on that roadway. And so again, same thing applies with the underground um, pressurized pipeline infrastructure is that there, there needs to be a way for society to continue forward while still addressing the issues. Um, and and it, it, it may sound expensive now, but it would be even more expensive if we were to wait and not address it, you know, uh, today. Right. So, you know, it's obvious just from our conversation so far that there's a lot of these pipelines, they're aging and the longer we wait to fix them or rehab them, it's going to cost a lot more money and potentially cause a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. So while there are risks involved, what are some things that can be done, techniques, strategies mm -hmm. for renewing or rehabilitating this infrastructure? Because I know that that's something that you get to work on now. Yeah, absolutely. So really when it comes when it boils down to is that you have the traditional way of performing uh, rehab work for underground pipelines is to dig and replace. Uh, and, and, and in some cases, um, you know, this makes sense. It's the most efficient. There's it's, it's, uh, there's a least amount of disruption. But the, the great thing about where we've come in the engineering community is that there have been uh, technologies that have developed and matured over the last several years that have been able to address the, the added challenges and the newer challenges that we face uh, trying to rehabilitate uh, various pipelines underground. Uh, and so with that, the, the realm of, of trenchless technologies is, is really kind of where uh, everything will kind of fall under. And so you have your, essentially your trench uh, methods of, of uh, replacing or re rehabilitating, you know, pipelines, but then you have your trench list. And within those trench lists, that trench list realm, um, there's a few objectives that we're trying to uh, achieve. And one is to extend the life of the existing infrastructure, which, you know, is the, is 
one of the, the main goals. Uh, and then asking yourself, it, it, do we need a structural solution or do we, do, do we have a good pipe, but it's just leaking? So do we need just more of a semi-structural design to, to stop maybe some, some unfortunate leaking? Uh, and then, of course, one of the objectives with Trenchless is it really trying to minimize the disruption in the, uh, the local community. Uh, like I said, that's kind of more of an indirect cost. Uh, it's harder to quantify uh, that impact. But um, if you talk to any you know, local council member or, or a local leader, you know, there is a type of cost uh, to that. Uh, and then, of course, you know, from a health perspective, uh, being NSF 61 rated for potable water is always the, the goal as well. And so with that, um, there are a variety of, um, you know, options that we can choose from, uh, from, you know, what we call a cured in place pipe uh, is essentially a, a pipe within a pipe uh, that is inverted or pulled through and inflated. Uh, and then that can cure in place. Uh, we also have a, a fiber uh, reinforced polymer uh, that essentially goes up like, like wallpaper uh, for larger diameters. Uh, there's pipe bursting um, where a, a head will, will come through the existing uh, pipe. Essentially break that pipe apart and then pull a new pipe through. Uh, we have spray in place pipe uh, that uh, you essentially uh, kind of like uh, when you texture a wall uh, at your house, it, it's a uh, cementitious material that is sprayed along the pipe that then builds up thickness uh, for rehabilitation. Uh, and of course there's slip lining, uh, which you're pulling a smaller pipe within a larger host pipe uh, to be able to uh, you know, convey that, that fluid or that medium, whatever, or media, whatever you are you know, pulling through. So, so with these options out there, you know, the whole idea is to trying to add tools to your toolbox for engineers and agencies to consider, you know, sometimes that, you know, some, a few of them are not a good fit, but in many cases, um, at least one or two of these, these options uh, are a good choice to at least consider because when you look at the traditional way of performing this work, there's a lot of add on cost uh, that may not be apparent up front, but is realized uh, further down the road uh, with the project details. And so things like restoration, things like traffic control, uh, that there's a cost to that. Uh, and of course, the, the longer schedules that it takes uh, when you dig uh, everything up, uh, utility conflict risk um, with digging uh, everything up. And so you, you don't know what's underground until you, you know, get to it, uh, which could be very costly you know, at the time. And so um, all these factors go into um, being able to consider uh, a trenchless method as a viable, feasible alternative, if not the, the main uh, purpose. And so a few of the questions that uh, are typically asked when, when going down this route is, you know, what type of problems is a pipeline system experiencing? So that kind of goes into, you know, you're really trying to answer and, 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 and get to what is the actual issue uh, that we're having. And so another question is how much longer do I need this asset? I mean, is, are we trying to have a brand new life design life incorporate, or does the pipe just need to carry another few years before a bigger project, you know, comes in, but right now something needs to occur. Um, and of course, uh, you know, additional capacity in the pipeline, you know, what are we looking at as far as demand? There are, uh, many projects throughout the country where they are upsizing, uh, their pipelines, uh, and so to do, to meet and, 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 and keep up with the demand. But in, in many, many other cases, we are looking at just rehabilitating the pipe size. Uh, works just great, but we just need to be able to replace it uh, appropriately. Um, and then, of course, there's always the, the, the multiple services uh, connections that we may have off of a potable water line to help serve those communities, the houses, the apartments, the businesses, uh, that becomes a, a, a big challenge that we, we need to, to tackle. So Steve, all that being said, sounds like some really good potential <clears throat> solutions for different scenarios potentially. And you gave some questions there that engineers can walk through with their clients or agencies yeah. to determine whether or not these are good solutions for a specific project. But if the answer is yes, if the answer is these are potentially good solutions, what are the steps in terms of an engineer specifying these items, finding out more information, putting them on their plans, yeah. walking a contractor through them? Tell us about that step in the process if they decide this is right for them. 
Yeah, of course. Um, so again, you know, it starts with, you know, what kind of landscape, what kind of issues are, are, are any engineer or agency uh, experiencing at this time. And so, you know, it, it, and where it starts is, is trying to break the ice on even thinking outside the box, you know? So, so, you know, that, that's where I step in as my role uh, to help these engineers and agencies, you know, understand what are the other options, right? You know, I, I know in my garage, um, I like to have a, a toolbox full of different unique, different little tools to be able to address any issue that may come up. But I need, I need to understand and know, you know, what's in my toolbox before I could properly apply uh, those items and those ideas to certain scenarios. Um, and so that's where uh, it, it's, it really starts at, you know, day one of, of planning and or design. Um, and so if an engineer, you know, just got a contract uh, with an agency to take a look and at a pipeline that needs to be uh, addressed or maybe like a network of, of pipelines uh, in a, you know, in a small community or whatnot. Uh, it really starts uh, at day one, understanding what's in the toolbox and then coupling that with the challenges and the, the objectives of that project. Uh, and then, and then having those two mesh together uh, to come up with the, the most optimal uh, solution, you know, trying to, of course, you know, there's always the, the top three, there's, there's high quality, you know, under budget, uh, and within, um, you know, uh, ahead of schedule. And so trying to meet all of those as best possible uh, is the, the ultimate goal. Now, you know, we all know from the, the construction world uh, and, in, and overall engineering world is that, you know, between quality, schedule, and, and, and cost, you know, you get to pick two. One of them is going to suffer, but trying to minimize uh, the, the total impact uh, while still providing a high quality product is, is the ultimate goal. So, for those listening uh, and you're wondering, you know, when should I incorporate, you know, this stuff, you know, at, at, at you know, the, the, the answer is, you know, at any time you should consider it, but the opt optimal time is to get it early in design. So, uh, you know, I am, uh, I am available to, uh, you know, for calls or emails or, you know, you can uh, reach me on my LinkedIn uh, account to message me on any type of questions you may have. Um, but it really starts with the engineer. Uh, moving forward. That's great. And we're going to link to all of Steve's information in the show notes for this podcast on our website, as well as below this video on YouTube. So what we're going to do now is we're going to come back in just a minute and we're going to put Steve on the civil engineer hot seat. And really, since he's been on it before, we're going to talk to him about his recent career transition a little bit, as there might be some things that you could take out of it if you're thinking about making a transition in your career moving forward. I hope you are enjoying this episode of the Civil Engineering Podcast, which is produced by the Engineering Management Institute. Please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel here for more podcast episodes and for all of our Engineering Manager 8020 Shorts videos that we publish weekly where we interview successful engineering managers. Now it's time to jump into our Civil Engineering Hot Seat segment. We're back with Steve Soldati, civil engineer with in situ form, and he told us a lot about pressurized pipe systems and how we can uh, kind of help with rehabilitating some of them going forward. However, what I want to focus on in the hot seat segment today is Steve recently made this kind of transition, career transition. You know, civil engineering is a big, big field with a lot of different disciplines, and Steve was doing something different. And about six months or so ago, he made the transition. So, Steve, take us through a little bit your thought process of why you wanted to make a transition and how you approach the entire process. Yeah, of course. Um, so, it, it, for you know, for me, it it goes all the way back to college. You know, I, I knew I wanted to major in an engineering uh, degree uh, or program, which you know it ended up being civil. Um, but I, I, in the back of my mind, I always want had an interest in on the business side you know, of things. I even came close to minoring, uh, in a business, um, degree. Uh, but just, you know, you know, any engineering student knows that, you know, the engineering workload is, or, um, classwork is, is, is heavy enough. And so I end up not officially, um, 
going that route of, of, of trying to earn a, a minor in business, but always had that interest. Um, and so, uh, you know, kind of fast forward to, you know, my graduation, uh, unfortunately I graduated in 2009. So right when the recession was, was at its peak and trying to, you know, get into some work. Um, but I got into construction early on cause the army Corps of engineers, uh, had, uh, already appropriated a bunch of funding for some work. And so I was fortunate, uh, to get on some, some work in construction and really kind of see that side of the, of the industry. Um, but, you know, all through my twenties, uh, you know, the, the goal was to get as, as much exposure as possible. Uh, and so with that, uh, you know, saying yes to many opportunities and, 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 you know, giving 110% uh, on certain tasks and new responsibilities. Um, now if, if, you know, kind of fast forward to my late twenties, uh, you know, long story short, made a life move to, from California to Florida. Uh, now I'm looking for an, another job, um, at that time back in 2014. Um, and, um, you know, from there I knew that I had limited experience, uh, one, you know, in Florida and also limited experience, um, outside of, uh, federal government, uh, projects in construction. So, you know, with that, I, I knew that something had to kind of give, um, from my end. And so I, I, I just decided to kind of shotgun out a, a variety of calls, you know, emails, you know, work, work current, um, um, connections that I had with ASCE sure. uh, and other, uh, you know, society um, communities. Um, and ultimately that led to, um, you know, a job with, um, with a company in the transportation world, uh, which, which was great. And so, um, so, you know, I, I did, um, you know, my time there got into a, a in-house consulting uh, position where, you know, again, I was helping clients, um, uh, specifically the, uh, the Florida's, uh, turn back enterprise, uh, plan budget and execute their work program. So from projects, uh, you know, small, like repl- replacing some, some street lighting all the way up to, uh, helping to execute projects to expand uh, a roadway network. And so a variety of different projects, you really need to kind of, uh, have that type of personality where, uh, you, you try to rally the troops, you know, get the teams together, have open communication, uh, and just be somebody that others want to work with you. Because I know that within the engineering community, there is a wide variety of personalities, of types of people, types of of uh, uh, different types of roles and responsibilities. You know, for, it's not just engineering, but there's engineering, there's contracts, uh, there's planners. Uh, and so really trying to be that person to bring everyone together to, to tackle solutions because there's, there's always challenges every week. And so, uh, but for me, um, you know, that was a great exposure, great experience. Um, but it was so focused on, you know, projects, um, that I still had that desire, uh, to kind of get that sales and business development experience under my belt. Um, and to have more of a business, uh, focus rather than just a project focus. And so Mm -hmm. for me, um, you know, I was, um, you know, looking around, I felt like the, the type of business that would best suit, um, to meet my desire for my career was a company that, uh, sells a product versus you know, a consulting company. Sure. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I interviewed, uh, you know, with this company in situ form technologies, uh, and they were looking to, uh, you know, make changes, you know, make, you know, go, go in new directions and, and, and trying to keep up with, with, uh, the demand, uh, within the, the pressurized pipeline industry. And so for me, that was very exciting to, uh, to start something new. You know, I was, you know, I'm in my, uh, young thirties. I'm, I'm still kind of really trying to, you know, you know, increase my career growth. Uh, and so for me, this, this was a really exciting opportunity to, uh, to test out, you know, what I thought, what I think I, I, I may have as far as, as far as a skill set thus far, and then develop, continue to develop my skill set you know, within this realm. Uh, you know, again, for me, you know, just my personality being an engineer, I, I really like to be around people, meet new people, develop relationships, continue them. Uh, and so, um, that's just, you know, a part of me that, um, is, is really, uh, being able to, um, come up with a good game plan. 
That's great. And so it sounds to me like, Steve, you made two big transitions. One, of course, moving from California to Florida, mm-hmm. you know, relocating across the country, which is huge in terms of lifestyle change and career transition. But then secondly, you made a second career transition change recently from one type of work in the world of civil engineering to another yeah. type, more business and sales driven. But it sounds like that one of the biggest factors in helping you to make these transitions mm-hmm. successfully was kind of the network of people mm-hmm. that you built around you. Is that accurate? Yes, absolutely. Um, I can't say enough about the the type, the network of, of people um, within the engineering community, um, and specifically the civil, because I don't have any the experience with you know mechanical or the, the tech or any of that. But um, within the civil community, um, you know, going from you know a, a, an entry level position, all even all the way up to you know when you hit thirty years old and even beyond the community, you know, the world around you becomes a lot smaller, the more experience you get and the more people you meet. And so it's actually pretty unbelievable of just how many degrees uh, of separation uh, are right around you that, you know, um, you know, the whole like six degrees of separation, you know, idea um, that can be said for the engineering community as well. And, And it might even be smaller than that, you know, maybe even like two or three degrees. Um, but my first boss and first mentor, uh, Larry Smith, uh, from the Corps of Engineers, uh, was a, a huge help, you know, with that and actually helped set my foundation for my career. Uh, and I can't thank him enough uh, for what he did uh, way back then. Um, but just he showed me just how much it means to have that community with whether it's ASCE, whether it's the uh, uh, you know, National Society of Professional Engineers, uh, you know, whether it's SWE, wh- you know, whatever it may be, um, right. having that community, being able to get out uh, and, and, and uh, get those connections um, is, is paramount for, for career growth. And not just career growth, but also just flexibility. You know, we live in a world where, you know, it's so easy to fly from East Coast to West Coast and the communication is so much more open than it, than it used to be. And so, um, but, but, you know, one caveat to that is that, you know, because uh, I had a lot of students uh, when I was part of the ASE uh, Young Member Forum is, you know, they're very, very afraid that they, that they won't quite be as impressive as they think they should be. But, you know, it's not, it's not about going out there and, and trying to be like the best thing since sliced bread, but rather going out there and just putting a face to the name, you know, being out, you know, going out there and saying, hey, you know, I'm so-and-so, I'm here, this is where I work. Um, and, and then things will grow organically, uh, from there, but it's just a matter of just, you know, getting out. So if there's a happy hour that maybe a local group is having, just, just go out there and, and meet a couple new people. You don't need to meet the whole group that night, but just start with a couple people, you know, or, or if you know somebody within your office going to an event, you know, that's a great icebreaker, uh, you know, to go with. And then from there, it will slowly evolve, uh, to all of a sudden, you know, somebody, maybe wanting to go work in like the, the Northwest United States. Right. Uh, and then through a couple of people, they have a foot in because what I remember from moving to Florida is that when I called up on an engineer asking for any open positions, you know, first question was, you know, who the heck are you? Second question is, do you have any Florida experience? Well, no and no. <laughs> um, but it's so much easier to make a cold call when there's already a mutual connection there. Um, and so people tend to just be a little bit more open, um, when you have those connections already in place. So, so there you have it. If you're considering a career transition as a civil engineering professional, what I take away from Steve's experience here is really two things. Number one, think about your strengths, the skills that, you know, the things that you do well and the things that you want to do and look for, of course, career opportunities where you can incorporate them and use them on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And secondly, you know, lean on your network to help you find that transition or, you know, navigate that transition because it's obvious from Steve's experience that the network is a critical component of it. And we preach about that all the time on the podcast, get involved with ASCE, get involved with professional associations, local Mm -hmm community organizations because it's just going to help you with all that. So Steve Soldati, civil engineer from in-situ form technologies. Thank you so much for coming back and visiting us again on the civil engineering podcast. Oh, thank you very much. Anthony. it was a pleasure uh, talking with you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the civil engineering podcast on YouTube produced by the engineering management Institute. We're always looking 
for new ways to help engineers become effective managers and leaders. You can view all of our content on our website at engineeringmanagementinstitute.org and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel here for our weekly videos. Until next time, please continue to engineer your own success.